Welcome to Root Words, a podcast that explores agriculture and cooking's role in connecting us to our landscape and our communities. I'm Stephen Abatel. Root Words is a collaboration between Vermont Farmers Food Center, Shrewsbury Agricultural Education and Arts Foundation, Shrewsbury Historical Society, WEXP, and many other community members. The project began in 2017 and was made possible by support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as from this community. Throughout this podcast, you're going to be hearing stories from people around the Rutland County region in the heart of Vermont, a region rich in agriculture, family farms, a region that's a pastoral working landscape. These stories are going to be each little windows into what a regional food system really looks like on the community level. We're excited to introduce you to some passionate folks working with the land and with food and bringing communities together. So please pull up a chair and enjoy. In this episode of Root Words, we'll meet a couple of city youth that found their passion for agriculture out on the farm. First, we'll meet Kimberly Griffin educator for UVM Extension's 4-H program in the southern part of Vermont, and later, Evelyn and Lauren, teenagers that are eight-year veterans of the 4-H program. But I'm gonna start. Okay, so I should- You can can just do what you're doing. You can keep working, yeah. (laughs) So we've got a new host for this Root Words episode tonight. Um, We're actually in the greenhouse, and I'm here with Kara Fitzbeauchamp at Evening Song Farms, and Kara's going to... What are you doing right now, Kara? (laughs) I'm filling up a bunch of trays to repot basil plants. Uh, Could you just uh, introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about about the farm out here? Yeah. Um, So I'm Kara. My husband and I started farming a while ago now, and um, we moved to this specific spot a year after Irene took our first farm. And we grow on about five acres. Um, We do all veggies and we also grow a ton of elderberries. And we're certified organic. And we have seven other employees besides Ryan and I that work here that equal about five-ish. The the nine of us equal about five full-time farmers. And how... I, I don't even know if I know the story. How did uh, how did you get into agriculture? Oh man, I don't even know where to start with that question. It's a fun one, I think. Maybe I don't know. Um, so I grew up in North Jersey, and I went to a farm camp when I was a kid, and I was just really enamored with being outside, being connected to food, and when I was looking at colleges, I was really overwhelmed by the college process, but the director of this farm camp had went to a small liberal arts college in the Midwest that he just thought I would love um, because of the community. And since the college process was overwhelming, I just, I went there and they had a really cool student run farm and I spent a lot of time on there and then eventually lived there. Yeah. After, after college, we lived and worked on a couple farms and then we just kind of felt ready to run our own project. So we took the leap and wrote a business plan and borrowed a lot of money. And I think we were like 25 when we had our first mortgage. Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) And someone told me, I learned like right before signing it that like what in Latin mortgage is death grip or something like that. (laughs) And I was really stressed at that concept, but here we are farming. But then you've brought so much life into the world since then. (laughs) Yeah. With that death grip. Thank you. Thank you. Death grip. (laughs) Oh my gosh. A lot of folks uh, are exposed to agriculture for the mm-hmm. first time through 4-H. Mm-hmm. Um, when you think of 4-H, what, what comes into your head? What do you think of when you think of 4-H? Well, where I grew up, there wasn't as much 4-H activity, um, but there was a countywide 4-H club. And so we went to it once as like a family affair to go to one of the 4-H shows. And I remember um, specifically there was like baby cows and like all these rabbits and I just decided at that moment that I wanted a pet rabbit and I remember like hearing my parents talking about how bummed they were that they had decided to take us to 4-H because now we were just obsessed with getting pet rabbits <laughs> so I think my exposure to 4-H um, was yeah through the lens of like how do I get a cool farm animal to be my pet because <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. not what I have access to 
Yeah, I feel like, uh, I mean, for me, the same. I don't know. And I just know the clover. And I know mm-hmm. it has something to do with cows at the fair. Yeah. Um, but actually, while reporting on this episode of Root Words, mm-hmm. I, I came to learn a whole lot more about 4-H. And I started by talking to Kimberly Griffin. So I'm Kimberly Griffin. I'm the 4-H educator, and I cover Rutland and Bennington counties through UVM Extension. Kimberly Griffin is a serious force in community organizing in the Rutland area. And Sage and VFFC have both worked with her in the Out of the Boxes Activity Box Project for the city. But I met up with her outside of the farmer's market to learn more about 4-H and some of the folks that are participating in it. Yeah, so I support all of the clubs in both those counties. So I support their leader um, in kind of higher level county level things, but then I'm also in touch with all of the youth who um, participate in whatever needs they have. So if they're looking for some scholarship support, they'll come to me. Um, I also help arrange shows. I help arrange, um, they turn in approval forms, which are registration forms for each animal they want to work with. They, that has to go through me and then I approve them to work on that animal. Um, so I could kind of do the, the logistics side of the fun. It takes an army of volunteers to assemble and distribute 2,000 out of the boxes each time it comes around. So I can vouch for that. She's really good at the logistics side of the fun. But back to 4-H. So they are choosing an animal each year. So um, they'll start with a yearling or maybe under a year, a little calf. And then that animal, they'll be able to show that animal as long as they stick with that animal for years. Um, And so they are grooming, they are working with a farmer to make sure that animal has the right nutrition, to make sure that they're having the right shots and dewormers and all of the care that animal needs to be healthy and sound. Um, And then they also get to show that animal in 4-H shows or in open dairy shows. And so two parts of that are they're showing that animal for confirmation. So they're choosing the width between the legs so that there's enough udder space or they're choosing shoulder height or they're they're looking for a straight back there's all these different things they're looking for in an animal and then they also are showing the animal for their own self for showmanship and that is all about composure it's about your relationship with the animal can you guide that animal around a ring with a crowd with a judge who's coming to talk to you so um that's those are kind of two parts of that animal relationship and then of course there's a whole bunch of life skills and um, interpersonal development that the human is having through that project. And the Trujillos are honestly pretty great show women. Evelyn and Lauren Trujillo were 18 and 16 years old respectively when I met them in 2020. I'm Evelyn Trujillo. My name is Lauren Trujillo. I've been working for in 4-H for about eight years in the dairy project. We'll hear more from the Trujillo sisters about their personal experiences in the 4-H program in the second half of this episode, but I still want to unpack 4-H, the organization, a little bit first. The mission of 4-H is to provide meaningful opportunities for all youth and adults to work together to create sustainable community change. It's a much broader mission than just showing calves at the county fair. The mission is achieved primarily through three content areas, civic engagement and leadership, healthy living, and science. I asked Kimberly, though, what specific opportunities does 4-H present for youth uh, in regards to agriculture in our area? Yeah, yeah, great question. I mean, I do, you're right, 4-H does does so much, offers so much for the development of a youth. Um, But I think specific to agriculture, it's an opportunity. So the, the Trujillo girls are a perfect example. They don't live on a farm. They have th- through 4-H they have access to farm work they have access to hands-on engagement with animals they're working really closely with a farming family to see the struggle and the success that is a dairy farm right now so for me like that's the, 4-H was their gateway to that experience um, so I think in the role of agriculture that is 4-H's role I also have to say like 4-H has a bigger role than just ag, but I think if we're looking specifically at that, um, it's a gateway. Similarly, I mean, honestly, I have to say similarly to FFA, right? Future Farmers of America is a sibling organization, um, very much ag focused. But so I would say like those two organizations are, are what's offering 
access to youth who don't live on farms and we need those non-farming youth to step into the food system. What Kimberly is saying in this section here, I think is super important mm -hmm. and, and something that is, I think, obviously a challenge all across uh, the country, but especially in Vermont right now as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, did. I had no idea like 4-H kids weren't necessarily all farm families. That was the impression I got when the one time I went to a fair as a kid. And that's why I thought, oh, this isn't available to me. I'm not on a farm family. Um, well, what are your thoughts of, uh, of, of, I guess, farmers in the in the farm world here in Vermont and, and uh -huh. just what's the importance of, um, of getting folks that didn't grow up with that mm. exposed to it? Well, I, I, I think it's super important. You know, when we used to do farmer's market, um, I used to love handing out like just free veggies to kids, you know, like parents would be shopping and I'd like, you know, ask the parents for permission, but I'd reach behind the table and be like, do you want a carrot? And the parents would be like, you're so nice. And it was nice. And that was my intention. But it was also like, these are my customers in 20 years. You know, like I need to help them get connected to local food and where it comes from and hand them a carrot with a green top, or maybe it's not fully washed and, and talk about like where we got it from. So it always surprises me again, since I'm like a transplant that grew up in New Jersey, not in a rural setting, sometimes I have to remind myself like that not everyone has access to their food system, even, even though we're in rural Vermont. Um, so there's, yeah, there's still a lot of connection to build between the community who is not farmers around here. So we were talking a bit about, um, young people getting into agriculture and folks mm -hmm. that maybe hadn't grown up with mm -hmm. like you, both you and I that didn't mm -hmm. grow up, um, on a farm. Mm -hmm. Um, what about, what thoughts do you have specifically about the importance of getting young women into agriculture? Oh man, so many great thoughts. Like just in general, any, any field of work is a great thing to expose young women to, to show us that we belong there. I'm sure a lot of women can relate to this feeling of when they're doing something, often feeling this like imposter syndrome, like, do I belong here? Um, is there space for me here? And, um, it, I, I, our farm is really fun and special of the nine folks that work here seven of us are women and when when customers notice it or younger kids especially it, it always stands out um, and I just like I just like talking about that with people when they notice it and talking about you know that that any anyone can farm anyone with a passion for like caring for the land feeding their community working hard um problem solving, thinking about the future. If you have any of those passions, you belong being a farmer for sure. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And so let's, uh, let's meet a couple, uh, <laughs> let's meet a couple of those folks now, a couple of really, I think, inspirational, um, mm -hmm. new, new folks into the farm and ag scene. First, we'll hear from Lauren and then her sister, Evelyn. I love agriculture so much. Like I didn't grow up on a farm. I was born in the city in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I was pretty far from farm life. But when I came out here, I joined 4-H and I loved it so much. I've been in it for the, ever since we moved here. I love ag so much and just working with them. I think it's great, like, especially like for Vermont. Agriculture really connects all of us. I love working with my heifer because it just makes me feel good watching them grow, like getting to work with them, noticing each cow has their own personality. I just feel more connected to them and my community when I work with them. So. It's helped me grow in a lot in the sense of my shyness. When I, was, when I first started out, I was painfully shy. Um, I was very quiet, I was very standoffish, and then 4 kind of helped me come into my own. Just joking around a little bit with people or um, just to be a little more loose. And then being with uh, from the city, I never really got to work with animals like this. So it's really nice because once you start working with one in May or June or even April, you'll start to see their little quirks on your heifer. You can see in their eyes and like, they get this little look that you can tell when they're getting nervous or scared or when they're happy or I've had some heifers where uh, 
I was just nervous and they could sense it and sometimes they'll get a little riled up or sometimes you'll just have those loving moments when you're uh, in the evening after the show and you're waiting to go home you're just sitting there and a lot of kids after the show like to lay on their heifer so when you're laying there sometimes they'll rest their head on you or fall asleep with them it's just one of those touching moments um, I first started because I was at a fair once and I just fell in love with a little jersey in a pen that was in the dairy barns and I was around 10 or 11 and after that my uncle just kept on encouraging us you know what you ought to just get in 4-H so we tried it fell in love with it and we've been doing it since we mean I mainly stay with uh, the Jersey breed um, which is what I have right here this is lady um, she's got a little bit of a tooth but every breed has their own level but jerseys are more prominent in it so this is Speckle. I've been working with her for about a year, almost a year now. She's a Jersey. She is my favorite breed because all Jerseys have their own unique personality. That's what I love about them. I like a challenge to work with. So, yeah. yeah, she is a fall, she is a fall calf this year. So I'm very happy I get to work with her. So our club has multiple groups, like I am a senior this year. Then we have juniors that are in a younger division, and we actually have a peewees group for about ages, it's like six, how old, like six, six, eight, six, roughly six to eight years old. They all love it, and they, we have an even younger group than that. They're called Clover Buds. Yeah, so four ages for all ages, no matter how young or old you are, but that's one thing that really connects us all, is just being able to all work together. We all help each other a lot. Like, you'll see the older members showing the younger members how to clip and show. Everyone loves it. It's just a great time. I've made a lot of friends all over the state through 4-H. Um, even just making calls on, like, which bet to get or these are the shots that are required. So there's a lot of people. That's how even I got my first job for... I work at Hathaway Farm and Corn Maze. It's such a close-knit community. It, it really does feel like family. I love working with younger members, showing them what I know. Because when I first joined 4-H, I didn't have a clue what I was doing then, just remembering how I felt when all the older members that had been in this for a long time showed me what they were doing. It just felt really special, like they're getting to pass their knowledge down to me and I'll be able to do the same thing when my time comes. And your time has come? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even though I'm not a 4-H member, Evelyn and Lauren still showed this greenhorn a little bit about how to show. So when you're getting ready to show, you'll have a show box. It'll, there's all kinds of designs you can get for it, but it's gonna hold all the stuff that you'll bring to the show. So like we'll have some baby wipes to clean out their ears or if they get dirty uh, while we're waiting to go in the ring. We'll have um, a whole bunch of fly sprays. You'll have some sprays called Show Sheen to make their coat look more luxurious and healthy and shiny. Uh, you'll have multiple feed buckets for if you want a bee pulp, which makes their belly go a little bigger. And it's more like a candy treat for them. And then you'll have grain, which is also another treat. Or if you're, some people like to make it more nutritious for the grain. Just depends on the person. And then you can have a bunch of soaps. We use multiple. Um, one to make, uh, if you have a white cow, more white, and one that's just a general cleaner, uh, multiple brushes just to blend products in or, uh, to work on their top lines. We'll have, let's see. You also have multiple halters depending on what size heifer you have. If you have a cow, you'll have a large, so it's pretty big. Or if a heifer, you'll have a heifer size, or they'll call it a medium, and a small is for a calf. Calf is usually like um, hip high or lower. And then you'll have uh, a blow dryer for when you're blowing up the top line, just to make it a little more fluffier. And you'll use this powder called Firm Grip Powder. 
it's um, what people use, uh, athletes use it for like gripping handbars for like gymnastics and stuff. So we'll tap some of that in the top line, get the blow dryer heated up so it makes it a little more sticky in the hair. And then once you got it to where you want it, then you're gonna get some clear magic. It's a little white can and it's basically hairspray for cows. Yeah. But before all that, before you get to the actual show, which is really fun in my opinion to show over there, showmanship is one of my favorite parts over there. But one of the first things you'll need is just to work with your heifer and to start out with, we always start with a rope halter. These are really <laughs> cheap to buy. You can also make your own. They come in different sizes, but it's really cool to make your own because we've actually done that before. So, and you also want you also want to every once in a while brush out your cow's hair just to like just to keep it looking nice. You'll have different brushes for their tail just to make sure it doesn't get all knotted up. Then you have a curry comb that's for the main part of their body. T tell me again about the rope halter. Y you don't have to make your own rope, rope halter, so why did you choose to? Making a halter is just really cool and a fun experience because you get to really learn how to like build one. It's just a really cool thing in general. Like You can buy your own halter at the store. They should sell all kinds of different colors, but it's just cool to make your own halter because then you actually get to fit it just the right way to your animal. So Then it makes it a little more personal. You have something to hang on to for the rest of your life. Yeah. And every once in a while you want to wash out your heifer or cow. A cow is referred, refer, referred to milkers as cows because they are the oldest ones of the group. Heifers are more like the teenage cows. So every once in a while you want to wash out your heifer. Like if you want to white, whiten them, we use this so-called shimmer shine. It really whitens their fur. It's really nice for them. Then there are all kinds of different soaps. There's actually a squeegee that you can use to dry off your heifer after you're done so they just dry a little faster. Then it doesn't matter what kind of brush you use, you can use any brush that you want to wash them out with. You can get one from Tractor Supply or even just the dollar store will work. So yeah, finding brushes are really easy to use. It just depends on what your preference is for washing stuff. But really any soaps or anything will good. So do you, do you show calves at different different ages? Do you show calves and and heifers? How does that all work? Depending on the person's age. So if you're a little kid that's like 10 or younger, you'll show a calf. It's all based on the strength of the person and the height because you want the size of the heifer to match your height pretty well. So you'll want to be holding the heifer's head to like your chest. That's a good height. If it's like down to your hips, then it's a little too small. Or if you're above your head, then it's too big. So you want that happy medium. And the teenagers usually uh, will have the heifer sized and uh, the adults are more for the cows, but there's some older uh, teenagers that'll show a cow too. Depending on the breed too, the sizes differ. Mm -hmm. what, what do you two show? We show jerseys. Mm -hmm. They're usually shorter and they usually come in standard height. Uh, to our chest, so it's perfect size, and they have a pretty bad attitude, everybody says, which we agree with, but they're pretty cute. They're, we're partial to dachshunds, and they have an attitude, too, so. <laughs> yeah. I like to think of it as they have personality, like a lot of people say they're really stubborn to work with, but they all have their own, like, stubbornness in their own way. It's, they all have their own personality. That's the same thing with brown Swiss. They're more of a stubborn breed to work with, but they are so loving. It's amazing how loving they are. It seems like in 4-H you've learned at least as much about life as you have about animals. What's one of the biggest life lessons you've learned in the program? Patience. Um, patience in the sense, it takes a lot of learning and patients to get them to set their feet up the right way, um, learning quizable questions for a competition, um, hopefully getting that call for to go to that big show that you're hoping to qualify for, and being patient with yourself for like, when I first started, for the first few years I was doing horrible in showmanship, and I was really getting down on myself, so I had a lot of people and my 4-H leaders and my parents telling me just be patient, God will work it all out. 
just keep working at it and I eventually start to get better and just one piece of advice that I would give. I've been on this job for four and a half years or so and so I've known them for that long and um, have seen them both grow immensely in their confidence, in their composure. I mean, they've, they've always been composed, but um, the confidence and their, their ability to step into a show ring, talk to a judge who's a stranger, who's asking them hard questions, um, and they hold their own. They are both just so well poised and presented. Um, and I, I really think they could, they'll both do well in whatever they do going forward. Do what you love. There's all kinds of programs that you can do in 4-H, STEM, animals, um, woodwork. You can do anything you want. It's very diverse and there's all kinds of workshops and stuff. And just keep working hard because eventually it's going to pay off. I would definitely say you don't have to be born on a farm to have a passion for agriculture. But you you just have to have the love for being around animals and all of that. So, I, yeah, you don't have to. You definitely don't have to be on a farm to love to work with animals. Cause, like I said, I wasn't born on a farm, but I couldn't see my life without being in 4-H and working with animals. This was so cool. So, uh, so how you feeling about how you feeling about our next generation of, uh, of farmers out there? <laughs> how do we expand the 4-H reach and club and get more kids involved? I was listening to them thinking about observation um, as a skill that gets developed with, I think, any person, especially kids who works who work with animals or in any type of agricultural activity. Yeah, you have to be tremendously observant almost all the time. Uh, and then you kind of bring that awareness back out into other aspects of your life. And it also made me think about how lucky 4-H cows are getting yeah. all that really high quality care and and just thinking about one of our passions in farming is about however people choose to eat food or source their food in their community is great what I aspire to is helping us all develop a consciousness around food so whether you choose to be a vegan or to buy local or to whatever it's just bringing that consciousness like thinking about your food and listening to 4-H teenagers talk about the relationships they've built with these animals. Like, but I can't help but imagine that kids that have that opportunity are then gonna really put some thought into like, what animal products am I gonna buy? Am I gonna buy animal products where I know those animals are really well cared for? Um, so it's just exciting to listen to. There's only so much like lecturing we can do to each other. We just have to like live and expose each other to different experiences to broaden horizons, and that is clearly what they have gotten access to. What does it make you feel like, Stephen? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I hope that we uh, expose some folks to to these different experiences in this episode and mm -hmm. help broaden some some folks' horizons uh, with this story. I've had a super great time chatting with you about it, Kara. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for doing it in my greenhouse. Yeah, let's it's do it again sometime. Maybe I'll, I'll help you plant some, uh, transplant some basil next time. Oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn more about Vermont's 4-H program by going to www.uvm.edu slash extension slash youth, where you can find a local chapter or sign yourself up. You can learn more about Vermont's FFA program by going to vtffa.com. This episode of Root Words was produced by Stephen Abatel and Kara Fitzbeauchamp. Special thanks this week to Kimberly Griffin and Evelyn and Lauren Trujillo. Our musical themes are by the Salt Ash Serenaders. We are a project of the Vermont Farmers Food Center and SAGE. Thank you all for listening and for being a part of our local food system. This podcast has been made possible by generous support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We'll catch you next time on Root Words.